Hey everyone, John Reed here, author of 50 Things to See with a Telescope. This is part two of three videos on the Celestron PowerSeeker 70 EQ Telescope. In this video, we're going to cover aligning the telescope to the night sky and getting it pointed at a bright target like the moon. I'll discuss some tips and tricks, briefly touch on the concept of setting circles, and then discuss some solutions to the problems I encountered when first using this telescope. In the end, I'll share my final thoughts on this telescope after having used it for several evenings. This is Learn to Stargaze. So I realized last night when I was testing this telescope that explaining to you guys how to use it will be a lot easier during the day. There's a lot going on here and it's kind of hard to see when it's dark out. Now, even when you're using this type of telescope at night, it helps to use a red flashlight just so that you can see what you're doing. And it's red so that it doesn't ruin your night vision so you can see objects in deep space. So the first thing you wanna do is set the declination axis, that's this axis, and the right ascension axis, that's this axis here, into the home position. Now the telescope is in the home position when the telescope itself and the right ascension axis are parallel. And the telescope is straight up, not left, or right. So after we set it in its home position, we're going to use the locks here on the declination and right ascension axis and just lock that in place for the time being. Now we need to make an azimuth adjustment and an altitude adjustment. So this telescope needs to be pointed straight north. And the way we do that is we loosen the knob on the bottom and the whole mount will move. And you're going to move the mount until the telescope is pointed perfectly due north. And a little trick that I do to get the telescope pointed north take out my phone, set it to the compass app, set the phone right against the telescope and just rotate until the telescope is perfectly north. But we're gonna make a fine adjustment in a moment so it doesn't have to be perfectly, perfectly north. Now we need to set the altitude and the altitude you set the telescope at is equal to your latitude. Now I'm here in Halifax, Nova Scotia and our latitude is just under 45 degrees. So I'm gonna set the telescope at 45 degrees. You can see the little altitude dial on the side here and you use these two little knobs on the side of the telescope here to set that altitude. Okay, so I'm gonna lock that at 45. Now we're not done yet. Now it's nighttime and the telescope should be hypothetically pointed right at the North Star. If you forget how to find the North Star, I've got a video on that right here. But if you already know how to find the Big Dipper, you use this star and this star, these are called the pointer stars, and follow them up to the North Star. It is not the brightest star in the sky, it's around the 48th brightest. To make the fine adjustments to our azimuth and altitude axis, we're gonna get the North Star in the finder scope. It should be in the finder scope if you've done everything so far, um, but it probably won't be centered. So what we're gonna do is then adjust uh, the, the azimuth or the left right of the telescope, again, reaching under here and just loosening that and turning the telescope ever so slightly. And then the altitude, that's this lever and this lever, just to get the North Star centered in that finder scope. Now, to be extra precise, you can get the North Star centered in the eyepiece as well, and then you'll have a really good polar alignment. Now, after you're confident that the telescope is aligned to the North Star, you wanna lock off that axis down here, that's the uh, left right axis, and you wanna lock off your altitude because you're not gonna touch this again for the rest of the night. Now that you're ready to point the telescope at your first target, you're gonna release these tensioning bolts on the declination axis and the right ascension axis, and the telescope should move freely. So say your first target is the moon, you're simply gonna push the telescope over to the moon, moving it along the two axes, you're gonna find it in the finder scope, center it in the eyepiece. You may need to adjust the eyepiece so that it's comfortable to your eye. You're gonna focus the telescope and you're gonna observe the moon. Now, as the earth turns, you're going to need to turn the right ascension axis slowly. That's with this slow motion control here to keep the moon centered in the field of view. One cool thing about the slow motion controls is they can be moved from one side to the other depending on where your telescope is pointed in the sky. All right, now for some general tips and tricks. Now, I like to stargaze without my glasses and focus the telescope to my prescription. 
Another thing you need to be aware of is the position of the finder scope. So here we would use the finder scope like this, but if the telescope is pointed somewhere else, the finder scope is in a very awkward position down here. So what you wanna do is keep the telescope clamps loose and rotate the telescope tube inside the clamps so that the finder scope is in a more comfortable position. Then as you move the telescope somewhere else in the sky, you're gonna shift the finder scope back again to a comfortable position. You're also gonna to need to rotate the eyepiece so that it's upwards as well and comfortable for viewing. The other thing you need to be aware of is that for an equatorially mounted telescope, you need to divide the sky into two halves, separated from a line that runs from north to south across the sky called the meridian. If you're stargazing in the east, the telescope is gonna be on the west side of the map. And the way that you can tell that you're doing it right is the telescope will always be higher than the counterweight. And if you're observing something in the western half of the sky, the telescope will be he over here on the east. Now, as the night goes on, objects rise in the east and set in the west. So at some point, the object you're tracking is gonna move from the eastern side of the sky to the western side of the sky. Now, if you're following the object through this, you're gonna do what's called a meridian flip. So say we're viewing an object on this side of the sky over here. What we need to do is move the telescope back to the home position and then shift it over and recapture the same object on the other side. All right, now how do you actually use these dials that are on the telescope? Well, these dials are called setting circles. So the top one here is the declination setting circle and the bottom one is the right ascension setting circle. The way you use these is quite complicated and realistically the margin of error on these setting circles is far too high to be of practical use in finding things in space, but you can get an approximate location uh, for items based on reading these setting circles. And how you do it is not that easy either. Um, the quick and dirty way is with an index star. Maybe it's Arcturus. So what you would do is you would know, maybe memorize or write down uh, the right ascension and declination of Arcturus. So Arcturus for me is over here tonight. You know, we would point the telescope at Arcturus. Again, this is our index star. We know the declination or right ascension of it. And the declination uh, setting circle does not move. And then we would turn the right ascension setting circle until it reaches the known right ascension for that star. And now that is our index. And now we look for the right ascension and declination of our target. And we would simply move, or not so simply, because this is not easy, you know, move the scope until the declination and right ascension matches that of our target. And then hypothetically, you would see that target in the finder scope and then do your final adjustment to get it centered in the eyepiece. <laughs> and that's how you find a target using setting circles. I don't know anyone that does that. It's a pretty darn complicated way to find stuff in the night sky. It is much easier just to look at a star map or use astronomy software and star hop your way there or use a go-to telescope. So this is my third night out with this Celestron Power Seeker 70 EQ telescope and I want to address some of the challenges that I found and how I would recommend addressing them because they are definitely limiting factors um, with this telescope. So the first factor is the finder scope. I found it quite difficult to get in focus on the stars. So when I set it up, it was focused on that chimney, but now I had to get it focused to space at night. For the most part, the stars were blurry. And so struggling with this at night was a challenge. I mean, this finder scope's pretty small and it was hard to use as it, as it was. And so the addition of having it not in focus at night was a challenge as well. So I would definitely replace that with a red dot finder, which can be found online, you know, for uh, less than $20 for a scope this size. The second issue was with the eyepiece. The eyepiece that it comes with is 20 millimeters, but it has a very narrow field of view and that can make it a little bit challenging to find objects in the night sky, even at only about 35 times magnification. So I would definitely uh, upgrade that even to a 24 or 28 millimeter eyepiece, something with a little bit of a wider field of view. Uh, I've got a 24 millimeter eyepiece in there and uh, it's, it's quite an improvement. The third challenge I had was with the slow motion controls. So the declination control as it is only has a limited range of motion. 
So before you want to get centered on a target, you want to make sure that the slow motion control is centered within its range of motion. Now the right ascension slow motion control, it became sloppy after the first night of use. And so that means that I can twist it, but it doesn't actually move the scope. And so what I need to do is get a wrench out and uh, loosen these bolts that are holding that slow motion control to this cog here. And the slow motion control needs to be actually pressed up closer to that cog and retightened. So you wanna keep an eye out for that as well. You may need to have a wrench on hand um, just to fix that when that issue arises, when the slow motion control stops moving the telescope. And the final issue I ran into with this telescope was that as I was moving the telescope from one target to the next, the whole mount was moving here on this left-right axis. And this should have been locked in place and that's really tight, but it still moves on that axis. That should not move. And so that means uh, that the telescope was no longer polar aligned uh, and then it won't track the sky properly if that shifts. So if that does happen, you wanna keep an eye on that and then sort of redo your polar alignment, um, otherwise you're in for a rough night. Well, I got to test this telescope on about five separate evenings. And last night, I even got to test this telescope on the moon with a decent eyepiece, and it was actually a great experience. What I like about this telescope is that the optics themselves are pretty good, with my own eyepiece, that is. The view through the included 20 millimeter eyepiece that came with the telescope was not great. But as soon as I switched to this $35, 26mm Mi Plus eyepiece, the view improved significantly. Now, I didn't bother testing the included 4mm eyepiece because, as I said in video one, it's simply too much magnification for the telescope. And for most telescope targets, less magnification is better. Now, after I repaired the right ascension slow motion control, using this telescope for my Explore the Moon program worked out really well. I was able to take advantage of the single axis tracking so that I could concentrate on my task of sketching lunar craters. Lunar observation is probably the best use of this telescope. Now I didn't get the chance to see Saturn or Jupiter, which won't return to the evening sky for several months, but I'm confident the view of those planets through this telescope would be great. I did test this telescope on the Orion Nebula, and that was a disappointment, even with a decent eyepiece. This telescope simply doesn't gather enough light to bring out much detail. Now I have about seven beginner telescopes in the garage right now, and the view through this scope was probably the least good of all seven. Now bright targets like the Pleiades look pretty good through my 26 millimeter eyepiece. Although again, the included 20 millimeter eyepiece showed significant aberrations on these targets. The finder scope that comes with this telescope is good for the moon and bright planets and bright stars. If you're trying to find a deep sky object like a globular cluster, it'll be a challenge. Definitely swap out this finder scope for a red dot finder. So who would I recommend this telescope to? Well, there is a certain type of stargazer who likes to concentrate on a single target for a long period of time. I know several stargazers like this, especially those who do lunar crater sketching. But what about beginners? Well, if you have a budget of not more than $120 and you just want a decent view of the rings of Saturn, but are not interested in deep sky objects like lighter clusters or galaxies, then this telescope might be for you. If you're looking for a telescope to see a variety of targets, like galaxies and nebula, or if you plan on stargazing with kids, a small Dobsonian telescope or a large refractor telescope on an alt azimuth mount might be more practical. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Celestron PowerSeeker 70 EQ telescope. Stay tuned for video three, where I push this telescope to the max, taking a photo of M42, just like the one shown on the box. Please subscribe to learn to stargaze so you don't miss any upcoming videos. And remember, the future is looking up.